What's up guys, as usual it's me, Wasabi, and I'm back with another review. This video is not sponsored, these are my thoughts, personal opinions, and my own experiences with the product. And today we have the Polar 65 by Arbiter Studio, and this one in particular is a Yuki Aim Edition. Now here's a quick look at the packaging because that's what you pay for too. Inside the box, of course, you get the Yuki Aim Edition keyboard. This looks pretty special. It comes with an instruction manual and I prepared a little segment to better demonstrate how to configure the settings on this keyboard. It comes with a keycap and switch puller, a braided USB-C cable, very nice and bendy. And because this is a Yuki Aim edition, it comes with this unique artisan keycaps that are exclusive to this version of the keyboard. And that's pretty much what you can expect from the packaging. So both this version of the Polar 65 and the original version have been selling like hotcakes, but is it really that good? Well, before we go any further, I'm gonna share some details to better manage some expectations. The Polar 65 is pretty much Arbiter's first product of any kind, and it was just released last year. This Yuki Aim edition of the Polar 65 is no longer in production. Its last batch rolled out in December, but the original version is still available to purchase. The difference between the two versions are mainly cosmetic with its keycaps, and it uses a different set of switches, but I'll get more into that later. Standard version of the Polar 65 goes for $150. This Yuki Aim edition went for $175 when it was still available, but now you can find it on eBay for about $300. This is a neat looking keyboard. I mean, besides the keycaps that come with this edition of the keyboard, other than that, it's a very simple looking design. No dedicated media controls, no volume knobs. This is a pure 65% layout. And what stands out the most is this thick aluminum frame that is standard for all versions of the Polar 65. It's what they call a CNC aluminum frame, and you'll see a lot of this as a selling point for keyboards. CNC is basically the process of a machine program to cut the aluminum. Just so you know, the term CNC sounds special but not really. It's marketing. This aluminum frame with all the materials inside creates quite a hefty weight for a board of this size. But anyway, frame color options for the original version of the Polar 65 come in silver frame or a black version. And with each frame color, there are a variety of keycap color combinations you can choose from. You can take a look on their website for which ones are in stock. Now this is what the polycarbonate base looks like. Pretty cool how the light shines through, but really you're not going to see it and even less like Likely after a tape mod. As stated by its name, the Polar 65 is a 65% layout and it's perfect for people who want a small board without losing the arrow keys. I know for some people not having dedicated arrow keys is a deal breaker because they want to use it for more than just gaming. A little about the keycaps on both versions of the Polar 65. The keycaps on the standard Polar 65 are 1.3 millimeters thick dual shot PBT keycaps which come in the KOP profile. This Yuki Game edition as 1.5 millimeter thick die sub PBT keycaps and they come in an OEM profile. The Polar 65 being a Hall effect keyboard makes use of magnetic switches and these are hot swappable but just make sure that the switches you get are compatible with this keyboard. Switch wise for the standard Polar 65 it comes with Fuji Hall effect magnetic switches that are 36 gram linears. Actuation range is 0.1 to 3.8 millimeters. Initial force of 36 grams and the end force of 6 Grams. And for the Yuki Aim edition, it's a little bit different. It comes with Gateron magnetic switches. These are what I believe to be KS20s, but in a different colorway to match the theme of this edition. These are 30 gram linears with an actuation range of 0 0.1 to 3.8 millimeters, initial force of 30 grams, and the end force of 50 grams. And just so you know, this board has continuous rapid trigger and it's always enabled. I like to enjoy gaming peripherals as they are right off the box before adding my personal touch to it, but I don't mind taking this apart for you folks out there who are into modding keyboards. Ah, but this is a limited edition board. Should I? Yeah, okay, it's important for some people. I'm not sure what other cases this PCB is compatible with, but if you know, please share in the comments below. What's good to know is that this PCB has screen steps as standard. Build quality is where the Polar 65 really shines because overall, the build quality of this board is excellent. Even though it's not a full aluminum case like what you find with 
for example, a Tofu 65. The board is very well put together. Honestly, it feels like you're getting a run for your money. By the way, this board is heavy, which is not a bad thing. If you ever had the issue of your keyboard moving around when you game, I don't think it's gonna be an issue with this one. So how does this keyboard feel for gaming? Well, I gotta say that it feels pretty good and responsive. By default, rapid trigger sensitivity is set to 1.0 millimeters, but you can tweak that down to 0.1 on the software. Adjustable actuation works as it should. My favorite part about Hall Effect keyboards is the freedom to adjust different actuation points. For me, I like to use between a range of 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters, depending on the game. And when it comes to typing, I switch it back up to 1.8 millimeters. And good to know this keyboard has onboard memory and you can swap between different profiles on the software, which is convenient so you don't have to keep adjusting individual keys if you have a specific profile for typing and a specific profile for gaming. So how is the software for the Polar 65? I tried it, it works. Very straightforward and I appreciate how clear and simple the interface is. For a board that feels this good, there really should be good software to back it up. And the current state of the software is really not too bad compared to some others I've seen out there. Compared to when I first used this board with their prototype software a while back, it was something you had to install on your computer. It's only what I would best describe as a miserable beta software, which was absolutely horrible in my opinion. With this web-based app, even though it's still in a beta build, it makes the experience with this Hall Effect keyboard so much more user friendly. And even more so for Hall Effect keyboards, software is a big part of the experience. There's a tab to adjust your actuation points and rapid trigger sensitivity, another tab to configure the RGBs, and another for macro functions. The only thing I find missing here is the option to adjust individual levels of rapid trigger sensitivity on the up and down stroke, which for me is something I feel that all Hall Effect keyboards should have because that adds another layer of customization for players to personalize their gaming experience. If you're not a fan of using software, you can configure this bot manually. However, it's only limited to adjusting the actuation point and this is how you do it. It's pretty simple. First, you gotta get the keyboard into the settings mode and all you gotta do is press function and tab. When the light comes on, you can swap between two layers, one to adjust all keys at once and another to adjust specific keys and you do that by pressing this button on the top right hand corner and in this state you can select individual keys by pressing on the ones you want to adjust. Use page up to increase and page down to decrease the sensitivity and when you switch back to the original layer you can see that the keys you previously selected and adjusted are still highlighted in red. It's the same for this mode as well use page up and page down to adjust the sensitivity. This will not affect the keys highlighted in red it only changes every other key. To reset just go to the layer that you want and press on delete and to save and exit the settings mode, just press on function. You can also adjust the RGB settings from the keyboard. All you gotta do is press function and enter to cycle through a total of 16 presets. To increase the speed of the animation, use function and the right arrow key. To decrease, use function and the left arrow key. To increase brightness, it's simple. Just use function and arrow up. And to decrease the brightness, function and arrow down. In certain modes that use solid colors, you can cycle through a variety of colors by pressing function and the right shift key. The typing experience is how I would best describe it as one of the better Hall Effect keyboards to type on. For gamers who are looking to get a good typing experience right off the box without having to mod the keyboard any further, this is a good keyboard to have. You could modify it to make it sound even better, but stock as it is, it's pretty good for a Hall Effect keyboard. Honestly, I don't feel a need to modify this keyboard to get my money's worth, which says a lot. Comfort-wise, this keyboard feels a little bit high and there are no adjustable feet to change the angle, so I would recommend looking out for a wrist rest for a bit more comfort if you don't have one. So in conclusion, what are some things I like about this keyboard? My thoughts are going to be about the Polar 65 in general because the one I have here is the Yuki Aim Edition. So in general, for the original Polar 65, for $150, I think you are getting quite a lot of quality for its price. It does not feel cheap and I really enjoy the weight of it. The sound that this keyboard makes, stock as it is, sounds very nice. You have to try it for yourself to really understand what I mean. Along with the nice typing experience you get with this keyboard, the 65% layout 
is very good with its arrow keys. I've used this keyboard for a couple of editing projects and I feel that it's just the right number of keys. So on the flip side, what are some things I feel can be improved with this keyboard? While this thick aluminum frame is nice, I can't help but feel that this board looks a little basic. There really isn't much else to the design and the back over here looks like something you'll find on an OEM board. I think continuous rapid trigger should be an option and not a permanent setting. Gamers would appreciate the flexibility. The software is going in the right direction but just needs to add individual adjustments for the up and down stroke for rapid trigger. I think boards like these, the most important part is the PCB and the software because those are two things that gamers cannot modify themselves. And this last thing is specific to the switches on the Yuki Aim Edition. I feel these switches have a little too much stem wobble compared to some others I've tried. It does not ruin the experience but I feel that for a gaming keyboard it should have a bit more stability. So breaking it down to three reasons why I would buy this keyboard. Reason number one, build quality is great. Reason number two, the sound and the typing experience you get stock is very good. And the third reason is that this board is pretty popular amongst the gaming community. And that's a very good thing if you plan to mod this keyboard in future because with a more popular popular keyboard, you got a much bigger community and that means you have a lot more references of how people mod this keyboard. So would I recommend a Polar 65 to someone who's looking for a Hoi Fat keyboard? I would say yes for sure and for anyone who's looking for a good out of the box experience without having to mod their keyboard, this is a good recommendation. So yeah, these are my thoughts and personal opinions of the Polar 65. Hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe to support the channel and I'll see you in the next one.